hello friends today we'll deal with uh, a short story by sir arthur conan doyle the adventure of the silver blaze the adventure of silver blaze features sherlock holmes the detective published in 1892 this is a story that is collected in uh, the memoirs of sherlock holmes now i'm not really going into the summary or anything that deals with the background of the story the story quite simply uh, is about how a race horse is lost and Sherlock Holmes the detective finds it that's what the story is about now the first thing that we need to actually take into consideration here uh, is that how does it work as a short story now the concept of a short story by the time Doyle was writing the story in 1892 were, was pretty clear uh, is to short stories of course have been in vogue for a long time we have tales such as i mean we have fables we have stories that are part of the bible which are short so it's not just the short stories are about a story that is short it is it is important here to remember that a short story is something that is <coughs> that's different from a tale which might be speaking about a kind of moral that that is associated with it or a tale which is um, which speaks about universal values a short story on the other hand is something that deals with an incident which might be drawn from life which might reflect the kind of world that we belong to and in that sense while it is realistic in nature it's also something that is short enough in nature so it's not as if there are four or five incidents that become a part of it that's one of the main characteristics of a short story the main characteristics of a short story by the time doll was writing hmm, silver blaze in 1892 and he was writing this other uh, home stories hmm, we have pretty clear idea as to what the short story had become in the victorian era in the 19th century the other short story right is not just in england but even in america such as edgar allan poe in the first half of the 19th century who have written short stories and poe discuss a short story as something that can be read in one sitting so that you can see when we are speaking about one sitting it becomes something that is subjective in nature now why do i say it becomes subjective in nature i might uh, like to sit down and read for 3 to 4 hours someone else might not have that patience someone might feel like sitting down just for 15 20 minutes so that that definition does not really make much sense but a definition such as one given by william boyd when he speaks about sh the reason why short stories still make sense in the present age um, are extremely crucial for us to understand what a short story is and also what the short story has become by the time Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was writing uh, his Sherlock Holmes stories. Now, Boyd says that these short stories, uh, they have to engage the reader and not only engage the reader along with uh, being engaging enough, these stories should contain the kind of elements which which do not um, stand in conflict to each other in one sense now what does he mean by it when he says that they do not stand in conflict to each other or one of the reasons why they engage the reader here again speaking about that single incident or single uh, or, the, or, or the kind of stories which seem to speak to readers because um, they are speaking about events which are far more realistic uh, which are events which people immediately understand or can empathize with now if that's what a short story is in the 19th century we have of course along with Poe we have Mopasa hmm, the French writer Guy de Mopasa who was writing short stories we had Tolstoy who was writing short stories in Russian and there were other English short stories hmm, writers in the period that Doyle was writing it Wilkie Collins, Charles Dickens and others had actually written short stories but there was also along with writing short stories we are also speaking about a period in which in, in the Victor, in Victorian era what we term as the popularity of genre literature or genre fiction. Now what do we mean by this genre fiction that we have here? So that it's not just that I mean you have this generic uh, idea of what a story is or what a novel is but rather talking about stories which speak about certain um, elements uh, and these elements um, 
appeal to a certain set of readers for instance we have horror story short stories short stories which deal with the uncanny in that sense in the in supernatural short stories in the same way you have short stories um, which are about thrillers for suspense thrillers that you are looking at doyle short story is of course a suspense thriller that we have here now when we say that doyle story is the suspense thriller he was not alone in doing this this is something quite a few others had actually done poe of course had written uh, suspense thrillers along with poe there was um, there's ambrose bs uh, in american literature who was writing suspense thrillers in british literature we have suspense thrillers which fall into this traditional sensation writing sensation writing where which a appeal to the sensations of the readers well they are denigrated as kind of writing which um, which hardly dealt with serious aspects of human life but only had sensational elements or elements which were meant to just thrill the readers these were stories that were extremely popular and they also actually while having these sensation elements would uh, would deal with issues whether most more often they're not legal which they would try to answer and try to uh, bring to the notice of the reading public the loopholes that were present in the law now, that was one of the things that that happened with the sensation literature now as a part of this and along with uh, writers who were actually writing sensation literature such as sheridan lefano mr james who was of course late victorian early edwardian that we're moving to but other writers such as Mm, um, Nesbitt or even Amelia Edwards who were, who were actually writing short stories which were either mm, thrillers, suspense thrillers or they were writings which uh, dealt with the supernatural. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle also did something similar and mm, Silver Blaze belongs to this kind, is of this kind. It's a story that's a, that's a suspense thriller that's also a story which also has gothic elements in that sense it's a part of sensation literature now why do we say it's a story that has got gothic elements one of the most important aspects here about silver blaze is it's a story about the theft of a horse that's what the story is about and this theft of the horse happens at night time there's also something mysterious about it in the sense along with the horse that goes missing there's a groom that is who is murdered and a groom who is murdered where the horse is stolen and no one knows anything there are these boys who are in the stable there is a dog in the stable and none of them seem to have noticed anything that is the strange aspect that doyle actually speaks about in this in the story that no one actually has heard or seen anything in the night and which goes back to our idea of a sensation literature as part of gothic elements now along with this we are saying that this uh, this story along with being a part of sensation literature is also detective fiction now detective fiction again is not something that is hmm, that was really new when Doyle was writing it. Of course, Doyle was the one who had actually made it really popular with his Sherlock Holmes stories, but this is not, uh, he's not the first one to have written detective stories. In fact, um, crime and detection are really old. Um, as far as um, human literature, as far as our literature is concerned, we have crime and detection in, in the Bible, which is a part of Bible. We have crime and literature as part of Indian epics such as Ramayana and Mahabharat. Strange surprised mm, in the Ramayana, for instance, the detection of Hanuman, uh, detection of Sita by Hanuman is can be viewed as part of detective literature. Um, in the same way uh, as part of detective fiction. In the same way we are looking at crimes, well, in Mahabharat we are speaking about the incident with Draupadi and what she actually faces in the Duryodhana's court. This is, of course, a part of crime fiction. Now, so we are looking at crime in fiction as uh, crime in detective uh, detection as part of literature right from the very beginning. And there's a reason for this, why they are uh, present right from the very beginning. 
The reason why I say they are right, they are right from the very beginning is when we look at human societies or, or the structuring of human societies, if we go either with the Hobbesian understanding of how societies have been constructed or with the Rousseauian way of how societies are constructed, now Hobbes says that I mean, societies are constructed because hmm, man by nature is not someone who is a social animal rather man by nature is someone who is who is self-centered and is only interested in self-preservation and in that sense is a violent animal and as he is a violent creature for to protecting themselves they had to actually create a society where they which would have these rules and as it um, to, by creating such a society they felt that it was possible that they wouldn't break break the law or indulge in violence that's what the Hobbesian idea of what how societies came into existence came in, is is created now the Hobbesian idea of how societies are created that's what Hobbes is similarly Rousseau comes up with this idea that societies are created but man, because man by nature is a is a social animal he likes to befriend others he likes to form societies he likes to fraternize but he also believes that societies are necessary and that laws in societies are necessary for the simple reason he believes there might be a delinquent who might go against these rules and who needs to be punished and for that reason it's necessary to create a society so whichever way i mean whichever way we look at i mean human uh, utter understanding of basic human behavior and the construction of societies seems to be something that is artificial and secondly crime if man actually reverts to his original behavior or when man is someone who is being a delinquent would result in crime so that crime and detection become a part of literature because they are an integral part of human life of human existence as this is an integral part of human existence or or integral part of human societies these have always been included in our literature no let us get done with that now if we say that that's one part of it this detection that we are seeing in Doyle's story is not um, is, is also not just guesswork or detection where you're bullying various suspects till they actually come up with the truth rather this is detection in, in a similar fashion to what Poe had um, popularized what you term is ratiocination now what is this ratiocination ratiocination when we look at the term <coughs> is mainly to do with the use of logic use of rational how you use your logic how you use your rational thinking to understand the world now scientific logic rational thinking empirical evidence all these are characteristics of enlightenment all these characteristics of western enlightenment and there's a reason why we say they are characteristics of western enlightenment for the simple reason when you speak about empirical evidence what is this empirical evidence this, uh, empirical evidence is where there is proof which can be substantiated by the use of our senses the senses touch sense of sight sense of smell sense of taste sense of hearing you are looking at these senses which are going to substantiate whatever is happened so that this kind of empirical evidence is something that is being used here in ratio nation no such uh, uh, celebration of human senses or human sense organs is also quite significant because it it also leads to our viewing of these various senses as being highly democratic that is i give the same kind of importance to what i see uh, or what the king sees or what a po uh, what a soldier sees or even uh, even something like what a dog says now we'll get to the point why we say what a dog says now when we are saying that I mean this kind of democracy that is being shown here is what Doyle does here he plays around with this idea of logic when we speak about um, 
this notion of logic this the story while it's a part of sensation fiction is part of sensation literature as a part of gothic literature seems to suggest there is something that is strange unnatural uncanny that has happened almost something supernatural because no one seems to have heard anything no empirical evidence no one seems to have seen anything again no empirical evidence and when the detective he in this case Sherlock Holmes is called in to investigate the case there is no nothing like an empirical evidence that he can actually um, fall back on to come to a conclusion to figure out who the criminal is who committed the murder and who stole the house two questions that you have here there is of course this assumption that is this a, the person who stole the house also murdered the groom that is the first assumption that everyone comes to now there is no reason to back this assumption but there are two crimes and it seemed rational to actually um, look at both these crimes have having been committed by the same person because it seems too unnatural to say that there's more than one criminal involved and one came and murdered the groom and one stole the horse now as this not now uh, when Holmes actually enters the scene and he sees that this is the kind of assumption that is there and they believe and the police believes that the groom trying to protect the horse was murdered there is nothing to actually substantiate this this is basically faith this is also based on a kind of uh, firm belief that the people had the groom would naturally try to protect his horse that the groom would naturally love the horse Holmes being an outsider does not have the same kind of knowledge as to what is happening and as uh, what kind of person the groom was supposed to be he comes with an open mind not with a closed mind which becomes important for in detective fiction that um, character that the detective has to be someone who is truly objective a, a major part of scientific research major way in major characteristics or uh, major characteristic of what you term as scientific logic is never be subjective you have to be really objective just like a researcher is and the detective and his objective as Holmes here is he does not fall into the trap where he thinks that the groom is a nice person or groom is innocent automatically without looking at the evidence or without actually thinking about the evidence this one part of it but as we go further one of the things that happens is is this this there is empirical evidence of the negative kind that is present in the story now what is this empirical evidence of the negative kind that we find in the story the empirical evidence is quite simple um, when we say that there is no one seems to have heard anything no one seems to have seen anything the question is what happened to the stable boys who were there as assistants to the groom who were part who should have been there they find that all the stable boys were asleep they were drugged now who could have drugged them Holmes finds that these boys were drugged because they had partaken of a curry which the groom did not eat and the partaking of the curry was only possible because the food had come from the groom's house so who was in the best position to actually drug them the groom or his family not anyone else this is a curry that they had fed, they had fed, they had eaten they had partaken this one part of it but far more significantly there was a dog which did not do anything at night which did not bark at night which would, should have barked when there was the struggle and the horse was being stolen and the groom was being murdered what was the dog doing the dog was silent this is what Holmes says the curious incident of the dog in the night time now this evidence which is seemingly negative in the sense there is a dog which hadn't done anything which hadn't barked which seems to have been blind to whatever was happening this curious incident that the of, of the dog becomes empirical evidence for Holmes 
and he bases his logic on it the dog would not really do anything the dog would happily sleep without being bothered by whatever was happening um, only when it is someone that the dog is familiar with if a stranger had really entered the stable the dog would have barked this is Holmes conclusion Holmes inference from what whatever had happened this uh, inference that Holmes come up with which is a logical inference when you think of it again scientific logic but again using empirical evidence which is um, which is seemingly negative he comes up with an idea where uh, where he shows that the only person who is a stranger who could have come into the um, stable without really alerting the dog could have been the groom because it, there is only the groom's body so that the groom had actually entered which was with that much was obvious so when the groom entered the stable his intentions were probably not as noble as were generally presumed rather the groom was trying to steal the horse which uh, in the 19th century would have been sensational but something that was um, that became far more common with with race courses and race horses because the groom could bet on a horse bet against his own horse and Holmes and Doyle basically uh, Doyle through Holmes is actually speaking about the kind of world that they are moved in where people are so materialistic that they are no longer faithful they are no longer actually um, it's, it's not really possible to say that just because he's a groom in a particular stable he would be faithful to that particular stable or just because he's looking after a horse doesn't necessarily mean that he would want the horse to win two things which um, in the feudal world were never questioned Doyle had started questioning here in one sense we are moving towards what you term as modernism now along with this this move towards modernism that we are seeing here by the behavior of the groom we are also speaking about this curious instinct of the dog which then becomes a celebration of of law lo of logic in the way Holmes use it in fact this particular phrase has become so popular that it is used used as the title of a novel by Mark Haddon um, now Haddon's novel the curious incident of, of the dog in the night time is not really a novel about the celebration of logic but of course the futility of logic in a postmodern world that's what Haddon does here um, but of course it's, it's written more than 100 years later and the way Haddon views this idea of logic is completely different because he speaks about logic as not uh, being really democratic we'll not deal with that for the moment we'll only look at this idea if we say that this is what happens with your uh, with your understanding of of logic and we say that this is a kind of detective fiction what kind of detective fiction is this of course it's a celebrate there's a celebration of logic there's a celebration of rational thinking scientific thought but detective fiction is not a homogeneous entity detective fiction we have our noir literature hard-boiled detective fiction as well as country house mysteries two kinds of mysteries that we find here now when we say that there are these two kinds of detective fiction that we uh, often come across what's the difference while Neuer literature, Neuer coming from the French idea of night, uh, French term night for night, um, a hard boiled detective fiction speaks about detective fiction from a perspective where there are numerous suspects, the, the setting is not limited, is the setting is open ended. Secondly, thirdly, um, there is a detective who is human not superhuman who is someone that we can identify with and a detective who um, when he is doing this detection he is not doing something that is really out of the ordinary these are the things that noir um, fiction would actually show country house mysteries on the other hand speak about limited number of suspects 
speak about uh, or about a detective who is who seems almost superhuman in his in the way he actually uh, finds out the criminal the kind the kind of logic that he uses to um, to detect criminals seems superhuman but along with this along with these ideas the most important distinction between these two is while no literature seems to suggest or that crime is a symptom of a of a world which is of a of a world which is seriously flawed in that sense crime is just a sign of the various problems that are present in society and we are just seeing a small example here country house detective fiction on the other hand speaks about crime as a disease now what do we mean by that crime is a pathological disease the of the criminal as the son one pathological evil genius evil mind that we have here when we say that there is uh, the crime as as disease rather than um, a symptom of society it is if we find the criminal if we find whoever had committed the crime and in this case the first crime that is uh, someone trying to steal silver blaze is found to be the groom someone no one suspects the person or whoever had murdered um, the groom is none but the horse and the house was basically interested in self preservation it was scared at what was happening because the groom was groom was trying to harm the horse not just you know, he was not really interested in stealing the horse but rather in harming the horse slicing his for for like to in such a manner so that it won't be able to participate in the race or even if it participated in the race it would be sure to lose the race it would not be able to run the race with optimum energy now these are the things that um, holmes had found in the story these are the things that he detects in the story this detection shows that there is a single criminal and the criminal is the groom though i mean of course there is a hint of other criminals in the background who had actually paid the groom to do this or to whom the groom was reporting or who would benefit from what happens to the groom remember when the horse actually um, runs away after murdering the groom killing the groom in an accident rather there is a stable owner who finds the horse but who does not want to speak about this discovery he is also a criminal of course doyle does not have homes punish him suggesting this kind of crimes this kind of crimes where he finds the horse he the stable owner finds the horse he hides the horse he paints the horse various things that he does with the horse but he is uh, Holmes does not want to proceed against him does not want to start this criminal proceedings against this particular stable owner suggesting that these kind of crimes were crimes that were part of the world they are living in in that sense it, it harks back to our understanding of what noir literature is but far more significantly this story seems to fit into the country house mystery now why why are we saying that it becomes a combination of both and mainly a country house mystery homes when he speaks about the country houses and countryside not not in the adventure of the silver blaze but um, in one of the other cases what is speaks about it is saying there are these vast spaces where crimes can happen and there's no one uh, who is going to actually report or no one who out there who can protect people in the countryside in these vast areas in the 19th century we are speaking about the 19th century remember when doyle is speaking about what was happening to the countryside he is speaking about areas which are owned by these rich landlords and who have various tenant farmers who might be working there but as the zamindars are these landlords of owning these lands and quite often they are not staying there and there are these huge tracts of land that they own one of the things that happens is they do not have immediate neighbors which comes to the fore again in silver blaze the horse when it starts wandering uh, when it starts wandering it can actually it has the freedom to wander for a long time on the moors till 
the a neighbor a stable owner a competitor can actually kidnap it i wish it say i guess horse snap it now when <laughs> when um when this is what uh, if this is what happens with silver blaze in the story there is an idea that i mean this story with a limited number of suspects because the either one of the stable boys has to be suspected or else there was this re, there's this reporter who turns up to find out how the horse is doing when he comes to the stable in the evening prior to this death of the groom or people who have been seen in and around the stable these are the ones who are who are suspected so there is a there are limited number of suspects there are limited number of suspects there is crime which is almost seems like a disease rather than as a symptom which is viewed as the way the way you can see that i mean this is just um, a superficial understanding of 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 the police as well as the um, horse owner at the end because homes even though he knows that there are other criminals who are present in this in this particular case does not reveal their names does not reveal the stable owner's name to the police so we are we think of this story as part of country house fiction now along with this saying that i mean this is detective story detective fiction this is a part of uh, sensation literature this story has gothic elements this story is a celebration of the scientific logic and in that sense becomes an important part of our understanding of um <coughs> understanding of how enlightenment worked um we are also seeing that this is a story um, which achieves what you term as the victorian compromise now what do we mean by this victorian compromise this aspect of the victorian compromise comes to the fore when we look at the point of view from which the story is told now what do we mean by point of view or the narrative technique that is used the point of view in the story is dr watson's dr watson of course uh, tells us most uh, is the is the narrator in most sherlock holmes stories most sherlock holmes stories not all um, he is the narrator he tells us what happened in each case this is a case which starts with holmes revealing to watson that he needs to travel to this particular place and then we have an idea of what had happened from the newspaper reports from from a retelling of the newspaper reports that they that they start discussing watson and holmes in their discussion bring to the knowledge of the reader that there is a crime that has been committed that a horse has gone missing that a groom is dead the same thing basically we are going like um these instances this instance once they are told this they come through in the form of a conversation that they are having this the manner in which it is put forth to the reader as a conversation gives authenticity as well as a sense of urgency to proceedings now why do we do that why do we say that this is sense of authenticity reality for the simple reason they are speaking about newspaper reports and newspapers at that time were not so much about yellow journalism as they are now but rather newspapers which were considered trustworthy people believed in what was published in the newspapers in that sense it seems authentic but secondly and far more importantly we speak about the sense of urgency the story starts with home saying i need to go there we have to travel so that immediately the reader along with homes and watson is dragged into the story is dragged into the story and he is also re, uh, on the train to to dartmoor to find out what is happening now this journey that the reader is forced to undertake even though we are speaking, speaking about a story that is close to 130 years ago when we read it now we are immediately drawn into this time period because of the sense of urgency to, that is given to proceeding this urgency i want to um, state here is not just because of of the action that is happening but because also of the way the narrative begins and the what the narrator does wets and when he is narrating this speaks about how homes mm, 
shows this sense of urgency is highly interested in going there and what and how he too how Watson himself got interested in these proceedings and wants to find out what happened and then Watson goes on after they they go to the stable and start making these inquiries he is not really hopeful of um, they're managing to succeed he looks at it and he says that this is this seems to be at one point at one level um, uh, is really strange case he does jump to his false conclusions but the false conclusions only make him believe that his um, this particular case is almost something supernatural and it requires a superhuman effort to find this now if this is a story that was narrated by Holmes the superhuman intelligence that had brought to bed. Remember, while we speak about the common sense logic or the scientific logic that uh, Holmes had drawn upon, Holmes also does not allow himself to be misguided by earlier investigations. Earlier investigators, for one. And he does not also allow himself to be misguided by assumptions, previous assumptions that were in place, as, as well as this... Uh, these notions that the groom ought to be faithful, the horse has to be innocent, that beasts can only do certain things. These are various um, notions that people have which Holmes challenges in the story. We had already spoken about his open mind. But along with this open mind, this open mind, while it's seemingly simple, is almost superhuman. Why do I say that? I mean, by an open mind is not um, is is a, almost a superhuman thing to have. We are a product of our cultural baggage. I mean, we basically carry our cultural baggage with us everywhere. There are various um, conceptions that we have about things which have been ingrained in us thanks to this. Um, ideological state apparatuses that we are a part of but it's not just the state apparatuses that we speak of but even general knowledge general um, conversations that we are having with others as well as what you term as prayer knowledge you know the prayer prayer knowledge does not necessarily have to be scientific knowledge isn't necessarily scientific knowledge and the reason why I'm saying that prior knowledge isn't necessarily scientific knowledge we are looking at superstitions which become a part of how we view how, uh, various incidents and the supernatural incidents that we are viewing superstitious are uh, the superstitions that we are viewing there are these are explanations which do not really have a base in scientific logic However, people hardly question them because they grew up on them. Your, the, the world in which grooms would never go against their masters is something that is gone. There's a feudal world that has disappeared. Now, while such a world is gone, it requires someone with an open mind who can question it because this... Uh, what Holmes does here, he is looking for evidence rather than accepting what the statements of others. What you term as hearsay evidence. This is almost super, superhuman behavior. And this superhuman behavior can almost be something that is uncanny behavior, something that is that then would take it into the realms of the supernatural. But the story is not about supernatural beings. It's not a, it's not supernatural literature. It's not talking about ghosts and demons or happenings which, where we get um, superheroes such as Superman, Spiderman, Batman, or whoever it is, trying to help us out. But rather, someone who is using his logic and rationale to figure out. Again, things with logic, rational, common sense. Each of these, which is an extremely human thing to have. But which, while it's a human thing which people do not generally um, seem to have, I do not want to exercise. So while it is a superhuman thing because people don't exercise it, it's not an unnatural thing or a supernatural thing. Watson, Watson when he actually is narrating these incidents and speaking about what Holmes does, 
makes the reader at one level aware of the superhuman ability of Holmes and while making them aware of the supernatural, uh, superhuman ability of Holmes shows that it is not supernatural by giving, uh, asking Holmes as to how did he come to these conclusions. It seems supernatural, it seems strange, just like the reader would say this. They are shocked at whatever is happening and they ask these questions and then Holmes when he explains it and as he does right from the very beginning and I mean one of the earliest cases in study in Scarlet when he explains this or in sign of when he explains this he as he says once I start explaining things seem mundane is what Holmes says. Now Holmes no longer says that by the time they move to silver place but he explains it saying that at the end of the day it's quite elementary quite simple and the explanation is about of course as we said the curious incident uh, the dog in the night time and the dog that did not bark and what happened what does it mean when you say it does not did not bark at night time there is this comp combination of hard mm, of proper understanding of facts proper logic and rational as well as this almost superhuman ability to actually look beyond what others have done which comes through which we are saying is in one sense a combination a victorian compromise that has been achieved in this story now because what doyle does by this is make the story not just credible it is um, events which are seemingly incredible come across as credible believable realistic but in a credible manner he is also saying that this is a world in which not you and I, not Watsons, not other detectives or the policemen can actually find out the criminal but you need a superhero. So a being who is trained in such a manner as Holmes is and that becomes the Victorian compromise that we are speaking about. So we look at this story not just as a transition because we are speaking about people who are still stuck in an era where they believe in these feudal ideas that uh, a groom can't go wrong or um, to, to, the, to the modernist um, um, and saying that we are trying, moving towards modernism. Similarly, we are also saying that along with these ideas of uh, modernism, that uh, these ideas of transition, we are also speaking about this as a, as a compromise. So, this story is a highly significant story in the home scanner. Finally, this is the final piece. Now, why we say it's a highly significant story? Because it crystallizes what is the basis of Holmes' logic. Now, when I say it crystallizes the base of Holmes' logic, I don't just mean that uh, he doesn't. It's not as if he doesn't detect in other stories, not really. But rather, when it crystallizes, it shows that it's not just incidents that we see that are happening around us, which can be used as empirical evidence, but things which do not happen, such as a dog not barking, can also be used as empirical evidence something that is expected to happen and something that does not happen is equally um, it can be can be viewed as as evidence by the if we know what it what it actually meant in in, in normal periods and that's the reason of course Haddon used it as the title of his book and um, Silver Blaze is written from other perspectives by Simons and others but will not really discuss uh, these parodies of silver blaze that are that are present you can always find it online thank you